How can you make Google your best evangelist? How can you organize your website for maximum impact? Let's talk about it today. This is the definitive podcast for helping you plan, create, and execute dynamic worship experiences at your church. Useful, practical content in the areas of production, worship, communications, first impressions, and more. This is Making Sunday Happen. Hey friends, welcome to the podcast. If you like our show, if you are getting some great content out of it, if you like the guests that we uh, have on, if you like my smiling face every week, uh, be sure to subscribe to the show so that you never miss an episode. It'll come right up in your feed. And we're dropping new episodes every Monday for you. So be sure to subscribe if you would. We have a very big show coming up in a few weeks, our 400th episode with the one and only Chris Tomlin will be in the house. So be sure to subscribe to the show so that you're notified when that episode and all uh, new episodes of the show come out. They'll come right into your feed. So, But you don't want to miss Chris Tomlin. It's coming up uh, in just a, just a couple of weeks. So be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss that one especially. Also, hope you guys had a great Easter. I know you worked hard preparing and working overtime to uh, make it happen at your church. I'm really hoping that you got some some great rest and some great time with your family after uh, Easter Sunday was over. Uh, I want you to know you are making an impact. Even if it doesn't feel that way sometimes, you are making an impact for the kingdom. So do not grow weary in doing good. You can do it. You got this. Thank you for your service. If no one else has told you that this Easter, thank you. Your work is making a difference. Your work matters. Thank you for what you're doing. All right, today on the show, I welcome two great people. My buddy Mark McDonald is on today. I'm talking with Mark about how to make Google your best evangelist when it comes to your website. Uh, How can you adjust your website for SEO for Google so that it drives visitors to your church. can't make Sunday happen unless you have people there. So we want to drive more visitors to your website and to your live stream and to your physical church. So uh, Mark and I will be talking about that, how to use Google as your best evangelist. Also, I'm going to chat with Reed Verisoto. Reed and I are going to be talking about using the model of Hulu to better organize your website. Uh, So uh, we'll talk with Mark first and then read after that. So Mark is coming up right after this. You are a ministry leader. You either have no creative team or your creative team is completely overwhelmed. That's where our team can help. At 1230 Media, we are on mission with churches and ministries to help you visually communicate the gospel to your audience. One of the great ministries that we serve is Tithely. We've produced lots of visuals for their media library, PDFs and eBooks, graphics, videos, and more. We are on mission with the great team at Tithely. If you're looking for folks to be in the trenches of ministry with you and help you create powerful graphics and video, let us know your visuals matter. You can connect with our team today at 1230media.com slash custom to get your project started. That's 1230media.com slash custom. Hey guys, I'm hanging out at CFX with my friend Mark McDonald. Mark, you're doing a workshop on SEO and Google. Uh, kind of give me an overview of your workshop. Well, gone are the days that just having your website is good enough because oftentimes we spend an awful lot of time working on a website that, quite frankly, no one's ever going to go to. And when people are searching on Google for a church in your area, oftentimes your church isn't served up as the website that they should look at. So let, let's talk about website to begin with. So is my website for visitors? Is it for my current church members that are going there to get information? How do I need to 
be known for my website. See oh my there? goodness, yeah, I see what you did there. And the interesting thing is that a lot of people say, wow, the website is the front door to our church. The, the problem with that is that as we switch from a print mentality to a digital mentality, our website is the go-to place. And I know a lot of churches struggle between an app or their website. Right. And ultimately, most people won't have your app, but everyone will have access to your website. So you want to make sure your website is for your internal audience, but it needs to be friendly for your external audience. Okay, so both. So primary audience, which I'm talking with people here, and I actually just heard the reverse. Uh, so give me your reasoning for the website being primary for my internal audience. Why? For, for sure. So uh, the interesting thing is, again, it's as we think about a print-centric communication hub, which was our bulletin was the center of everything, as we slim that down, as a lot of people have moved away from print and gone to uh, web, we want to make sure that the people in our pews have access to all the information that they need. So the website is actually more for them. I would love if we actually heard the statistic that people are waking up in our communities today and they're going, I need to search around church websites. And it's just not happening right. where the majority of people who are going to your website are probably in your church. Okay, so, but if I'm not in my church, I'm gonna be searching for it on Google. That's right. So what, what kinds of things am I searching for? So if I'm, if I'm a church, I'm, I'm trying to get at how I need to set this up to make Google my friend and for people to find our website. So give me some pointers. Yeah, there. to make Google your biggest evangelist, you need to make sure you set up your content the way that, the, that Google loves it. And the way that they love it is the way that we use Google. And so what they, you know, we oftentimes, we, we somewhat curse the algorithm. It's like, if we could just figure out the algorithm. Yeah. The algorithm is exactly how we like to look for things. So most people are looking for church in their area. They get your website or a whole bunch of websites. And the problem is, is that you, you end up with a whole bunch of sameness. So there, there's like church here, church there. I, I mean, we've all looked for those things. Like if we're looking for the widget and then we get a full page of widgets, how on earth do we choose which widget is for us? And what we want to do is we want to make sure that we know what keywords they're looking for in, in a specific area. And, and it sounds so crazy, but just do some keyword research. And it's not as hard as it actually sounds. So give me some of those. If I were to uh, do a keyword search, what are some common ones that I need to be able to... Okay, so... And I'm tagging my website with these keywords so that... that my website comes up. Right? That's right. Well, and, that. and that's really what we're going to concentrate on in, in our session is how do you tag your website the way that Google wants you to tag them. And those keywords, like it's just, okay, so this is the easiest way. It's absolutely free. Go to google.com and you get your search bar. Start searching for something that you think your community would be looking for. So, so oftentimes, you know, a church will have a sub-branded uh, area on their website called Awana instead of kids ministry. Right. But then if you start looking for kids ministry in Google, it might actually, as soon as you put kids in there, it might say kids programming. And so if kids programming is the thing that Google is suggesting, because the, the suggestions are the things that pop underneath those the, the search bar, start looking down in those in those suggestions and if you're thinking kids ministry but it says kids programs more people are looking for kids program in your area so what we're trying to do is instead of using kids ministry on your page use the keyword kids program so is there any advantage for me to do a google ad a paid thing to make my website hang out at the top? Or Absolutely. I want to so if you, if you don't have your website fully set up properly for SEO, or if you have uh, your website just set up and you want to give it kind of a little bit of a kick, then you need to know what keywords you want to be, to be known for in order for Google to be able to serve those things to you. All right, so give me some more from your workshops and tips and tricks for Google. So oftentimes people say, well, I know what my keyword is. And it's like, okay, so 
you want to rank for your keyword. And oftentimes, like if I wanted, if I was building a website and I wanted to have a, a page that had, um, that I was selling shirts. If I want to rank for shirts, you can imagine how many other people in the world want to rank for shirts. But long tail keywords are the key. So long tail means that you're adding things to your keyword to make a key phrase. And you, so as soon as I say men's shirts, then there's a smaller group of people that I'm competing with. But if I say, uh, uh, plaid men's shirts, then all of a sudden it's a smaller group. So the more, the more extra words you add, the, the long tail, the smaller the audience, the easier it is to rank. So Google actually is suggesting right now that you should probably have a long tail key phrase of three to four words, but not much more than that. So what if I'm at a smaller church or what if all this language is super foreign to me? I don't even know, you're telling me I need to tag my website, but I don't even know how to, so maybe get me started there. Is it WordPress? Does it matter what, what platform I'm on? Kind of talk to me as a beginner. It does not matter what uh, platform you're on, but what you do want to know is so on your, so every page should rank. So whatever your page is about, so if it was kids programs or kids ministry or kids, it's probably not gonna be Awana. Not that I have anything about Awana, but no one probably is searching for Awana in your in your uh, community. So I don't know that word as exactly. In, I don't know what I don't know. I don't know <laughs> yeah, how, exactly. Why I would search. But that. if people are looking for kids programs, then you put kids program, and so kids program is is two words. It's the key phrase. Say that's your key phrase. Then you just have to make sure you use it your H1 tag, which is your largest headline on your page, needs to contain that key phrase in its entirety. And then weirdly enough, it just sounds so crazy, but you just have to use it also in the first paragraph and you have to use it. Google will rank you higher if you use it at the beginning of your first sentence of your first paragraph. So that's called a P tag. And so if, you're, if you know your HTML, you can look for your first slash P tag and then find what that first paragraph is. Make sure you're using it in there. And then on every page, that key phrase not only is in your headline, your first paragraph, but you should use it two to three times on the page. All right, so I'm going to go back to our kids programming example and the sure. Awana example, okay? So say I am a believer and I'm moving to a new town and I actually do want to search for a church that has an Awana program. As the website builder, are you, how interested in, in me are you or how interested are you in new families, unbelievers looking for church. You know what I mean? I do. And, and that's the tension that we all face. You want to make sure that if somebody's Googling kids and they know Awana, so if they say kids Awana. So maybe Awana's down in my tags. Yeah, exactly. So, well, um, on the page, if you have a sub-brand like Awana or if you have vertical generation for your kids' choir or whatever you, whatever you call it as that sub-brand, uh, sub make sure that you're not using the sub-brand in your main menu because that makes it confusing if someone doesn't know what it is. Say what it is. When they get to the page, your key phrase is probably not your sub-brand, but you should introduce your sub-brand probably on the first or second paragraph. Gotcha. Okay, give me some other tips. How okay. Can, uh, it, rank higher is not really the language I want to use, right? I want to use, give me the right language to use to make, is it Google be my evangelist, go out in my community and get people? Uh, to first-time visitors? Like, well, yeah. certainly the people in your community are probably all not waking up on, on Sunday morning and saying, I need to Google a church to go to. Right. So what we want to try to do is figure out what are they Googling yeah. that's helping their family or helping their marriage or helping their whatever. So there's lots of, if you just, if you Google key, keyword research, right. there's lots of ways, uh, keywordtool.io. Um, if you have a Google AdWords, you can also uh, just log into your Google AdWords and then there's a keyword research tool. 
people. So you find out what they're, what they're searching for. Oh, and then here's another little tip. So on your Google search, when it pops up and it propagates your full page, probably about halfway down, it'll say, people are asking questions like this about your key phrase. And then there's, there's usually three or four sentences or uh, uh, questions that are there. That's a really good way to say, I need to make sure I have the answer to that in my page. Or if you have a frequently asked questions area, make sure you like, rip off that question exactly and then put an answer in there. And then Google knows that people are asking those questions about that key phrase, and then they'll serve your website up as the answer. So is it more topical? Am I searching you know, answers to the problems I'm dealing with in life? and looking for a church that are solving those problems or am I searching Baptist church I want to make sure that my theology matches what where where are people leaning on that regard oh man i mean that's that's the big question today i and and ultimately what is the church i mean we could have a very long discussion about that uh, because ultimately the church is a collection of believers but today we oftentimes it's a, it's a great way for someone to discover Jesus. So we want to make sure that the people who are believers that want to find a collection, they find your website and that, that like, make sure you have the key phrases for them. But also make sure that the people in your community who just don't even know that they need Jesus, they don't know what they don't know, yeah. then in, give them what they're looking for. So give them give them what they need on the back of what they want. All right, so I'm going to get you to weigh in on this. Could be controversial. But weigh in on the church online physical church. Are you a both and or you know hybrid worship? Do you, you know, lean more toward the people going to the physical environment? Where do you stand on that argument? I see the online church as the greatest on-ramp to get someone to come to your church. So that is the purpose, is I'm doing online to get them to physical? You're trying to get me to, to burrow into a hole and then fall into it, right? Uh, <laughs> so what I will say is that... People should know we're buddies. So yeah, I, exactly. I, I'm, I'm trying to snag you here. Interestingly enough, I would say that, that people can have church online and go to church online and feel like they're in church online. Even though a certain generation will believe that there's only one way to do that and it, that's with physical touch and being able to be in close proximity and and because there really is something uh, spiritually awakening in a room of people that you don't get online. But that doesn't mean that they can't have church there I yeah. think it's kind of like when my kids came to me the first time and said, we need to have a phone that we can text message. And I said, why do you want a text message? And they said, well, all of our friends are on there. So if I want to have any friends, I have to have text messaging. And I said, as the old person in the room, you can't have friends on text. And they went, Yes, okay, we can, yes, we can. And yeah. now, after experiencing it and understanding it for a great period of time, I mean, you're a great text friend, even though I, we get to see each other on a regular basis. There are some people I have never met in person, but I would yeah. still call them really close friends. And I agree. I mean, and when we met in person, we picked up just like that. Uh, and I think that is definitely true. You know, you, you feel, you really do feel like you know somebody. I think my opinion on, on that is I'm probably going to, I'm going to be both and, I'm going to be hybrid. I'm not going to say that you can't have church online, can't have that community. I definitely agree with that. I'm probably going to lean a little bit more to the physical. Uh, you know, there, there's just that's something That's because about, you're old. That's probably because I'm old. And, and someday mature, I want maturity. to grow up to be just like you. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, but I, I kind of uh, equated it to, to marriage. You know, can, can you can you be married online? Yeah. Can you have a relationship with your spouse online? Yes. Do you, do you really want to or do you want to be together, uh, you know, at home, build a home together and, uh, you know, family, same thing with kids. 
you know, can you have a relationship with your kids online, a distant? Yeah. And, and I agree. And, and I know that there's a lot of churches that are grumbling about that. Like, how do we, how do we do both sides and how do we get people to, to, to actually come to our church? What I would strongly urge every church that's listening is that, um, make sure if it's an on-ramp, make sure you have the connection to to take them, if you want them to experience what's in the room, oftentimes, we you know, one of the crazy things I do is the mystery visit. We're doing digital mystery visits where we're, we're experiencing a church online to say what, what was our experience from that. And what we oftentimes don't see is any connection f- where they're talking to me online to say, here's a good reason for me to come in person. And if yeah. we're not telling people, they won't know. Yeah, I agree. All right, so let's land on this question. We'll wrap it up here. How does that whole discussion relate to Google? Am I trying to encourage people to come to my website, to come to my physical location, to come to my online experience, both? How does that relate into what you're teaching? Yeah, and we always have to look for the the, the place of least barrier. and. It is so hard to get up on Sunday morning, get a family ready, get dressed, get into a car, get them fed, get them happy, and drive them to a church. It's, as we found out during COVID, it's so much easier to just flick on your web uh, browser, let the kids play, let the kids do whatever they want, and while we experience church. And so the the... Uh, fewer barriers, it's just so much easier to get a connection. So your website needs to quickly take them to a video portal, whether they can watch something from uh, the past or whether what they're going to be able to watch it live. And then just make sure you have the connection points so you can get them into the room. Yeah. How can people keep up with you and what you're doing? Well, it's really interesting because be known for something.com is, is you know, the brand that I represent, but we just introduced a new brand called Be Found for Something, which is our whole SEO coaching, where we walk through uh, in four sessions with a church to be able to make Google your biggest evangelist. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate Thank it. you. Hey, guys, let me give you one quick way to connect with your volunteers outside of Sunday to help you develop a volunteer culture that's dynamic at your church. I know this sounds simple, but plan regular hangouts and events. Be intentional about how you hang out with your team outside of Sunday. So I'm gonna suggest two things. One, I would suggest one monthly casual hangout. This is go to ice cream after service, go to lunch, go to a movie, do a game night, something very, very casual. One thing I want to really stress here, though, is make sure that it is sent, that invitation is sent to your entire team. You don't want people left out of this. So if you have a group uh, message uh, thread or a Slack channel or something like that, be sure to send it out uh, on that entire feed so that even if people are not serving that Sunday and it's kind of a spontaneous thing, You can throw it out on the thread so if people can meet you there, uh, they can do that. Also, I would suggest doing one big quarterly team event. This is volunteer night, Christmas party, July 4th event, something like that. Something bigger that you might cater food uh, or decorate for in a bigger way. Okay, so do one monthly casual hangout and one quarterly team event. Make sure everyone is invited. Put it all on the big text thread with your entire team, okay? You are the builder of the culture that you wanna see in your volunteer team. So be intentional about how you are spending time with them. Hey guys, I'm hanging out with Reed Verda, Verda Soto. Yep, that's it. Did I get it right? Okay. Yep. So tell me about your company and a little bit about what you're about, and we'll dive into some content. Sure. So uh, I own Reed Verde Incorporated, and um, I don't know about your church. I don't care about your church. That's I'm the target audience, right? Like, I don't know yet. So what I do is I come in and I speak with churches about the idea of 
who are you trying to reach and what platform are you using to specifically do that with? You know, websites started as the only thing back in the 90s. Well, now we have websites and social and apps and all of these things. Well, each one has a, a case use. And honestly, we don't really get to say what or why people use that platform in the way they do. Let's go and target them with the right thing for that audience group. Okay, so do I need all of those things? Do I need a website and an app and all be on all social platforms? No, you don't, but you do need that mentality first before saying that because the idea is people come and say, hey, can you put it on the website? I don't think they're actually meaning that. They just think that's the only place that they can exist, right? We only have, uh, it's, it's just, you know, website includes all things. We can, we can have a couple of things. We can have different ways. We can have different places on the website to send people to. Not everything has to belong in every single place. Okay, so what is the purpose of my website? Is it to attract new people who are not internal uh, in my church, or is it for internal church members? Okay, I think it's, oh man. All right, so I even take a step back first. Okay. It is for the person who goes to Google and puts in churches near me and then gets returned something. That's what your website really is for because people are not searching for you. They're searching for an answer. So yes, first and foremost, I think your website is to introduce who a individual can be when they are part of your church. That's what it is first and foremost because there's only really two types of websites in the world. There is a... Um, there's a database like Expedia.com. That's, that's not your church. Or there's a marketing website. We have to eventually choose what do we want to do. And I often tell people, do you want people to show up at your church or do you want them to understand information? Because if we want them to do an action, let's prioritize the things that help them do that action. And therefore, the website, 75% of people are going to leave your homepage after only being to your homepage. You're going to lose them, that means. So I hope at the end of your homepage, they're like, you know what? I see myself. I think I can be a part of that. I would like to go. And there was a clear CTA of what I need to do, whether it's watch online or show up or come to Trick or Treat or Trunk or Treat. That CTA was so um, helpful for them to see themselves as a part of it. Okay, so new language here, CTA is call to action. Correct. So uh, you have a, a mind frame that our website should be framed like Hulu. Yes. Uh, kind of framed in that, in, that, uh, in that way. Tell me about that. All right. So Hulu, when you go to Hulu.com for the first time, is very different when you go to Hulu.com the second time when you're signed up. What they do is the first thing they do, you will not see any of the word we on their website. It says you, your content at your fingertips because you are going to love this stuff. And then, so that idea is they increase your desire. The next thing they do is they decrease labor. Two sentences at a time. All right, they don't say, we have a special relationship with Paramount Pictures, which means we are, no, no, that's too long. We say NFL, NBA, and you know, um, uh, premium videos at your fingertips. That's a short sentence. So they increase desire, then they decrease labor, makes it easy for me to understand. Then the last thing they do is decrease confusion. If you want these things, you can have Hulu, Hulu, no ads, Hulu premium, click that button. I think that every website should follow every page should follow that thing. Increase desire, decrease labor, decrease confusion. Because once you have decided, yes, I want to be a part of that Hulu model, you click that button and you're signed up, you no longer go to that marketing page anymore. Right? It's the same thing with your bank. You keep on going to your bank's website and they keep on trying to get you into a new credit card. They try and get you into a new um, uh, home insurance or a uh, home equity loan. And you eventually you get tired of being marketed to, and you're like, I just want to go and log into my portal. I want to go into the app, and it delivers the balance. Let me watch the upcoming video. Let me watch the, you know, uh, the, the special stuff that Hulu has. Let me go and check my balance. Let me do those. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So let's dive into that uh, in detail. So uh, one of the things you talked about is use you language. It's the mm -hmm. concept of, I don't care that your dog died. I care that my dog died, right? Okay, yeah. So, uh, I'm, so, so I'm so sorry. Right? <laughs> <laughs> or, or maybe a, a better way is what, what's in it for me. 
uh, I, you, you need to talk about me, not yourself, when it, when it comes to a website, right? So sure. talk to me about you language. So you language, what's interesting is we don't always need the, the qualifiers. We don't need to say, you are welcome at our multi-generational church. If your imagery is showing a multi-generational church, and we say, you are welcome here, if someone sees their age group and someone that looks like them, like, yep, they're talking to me. So that even helps reduce that labor and how much they need to read. So you so, don't have to say things like, we are a multi-generational church. Nope, nope, you get to show and be honest. And we're in this uh, this age of authenticity. Use, I don't ever show pictures of the building. I mean, if you've got a, this beautiful building and that's why people are coming to the church, it depends on your audience. I totally get that. But my church, we are mobile, we rent our space. We could be at a different spot. When COVID happened, we were in like four different spots but I showed the people so that college students and parents and whoever was a part of my church was represented. And when I said you, they could say, yeah, you really are talking about me. You would love small groups. You would love mom's day out because it's free childcare. I don't put on you would love to serve because I'm not ready for you to do that yet because that's not, I want you to be a part of this. But I would say you, if you need food from the food pantry, if you need help with your home, those are the things I want to target that new person that Google brought over looking for a church that has a need. You are going to be served. And this is what you can look like when you are a part of our church. So one thing, one big pet peeve that I have when it comes to websites is a very messy, convoluted navigation Ooh. at the top. <laughs> Trying to put every oh. single ministry that we've ever done in the navigation this is my website. hill to die on. All right, so talk to me about simple navigation. Okay, first off, nobody cares how you're organized. Most churches organize their websites by their ministries and their departments. Imagine walking into a church and meeting a pastor for the first time and say, hey, I love your church. Tell me all about your church. Tell me what's going on. And you responded to me and said, no, could you please walk down the hallway, knock on every single door in every single ministry and ask them how they serve you if they do. All right, see you later. That's how our websites are organized. We would never do that. You saw me and I came in with a kid on my hip and I come in with my wife and you say, you know what? You'd like the men's breakfast on Tuesday. You would like the kids Awana thing on Wednesday night. And uh, we have a family uh, gathering uh, for this thing. You would, you would curate that for me. So this is what I do. Think about your church having products. That's your main pipeline, right? We've got small group and midweek and these things that don't really matter to a specific type of person. It's just how we care for people, right? Those are products that people can engage in. The next thing we do is we talk about audiences. Children's ministry is not a, uh, a page in my model that I like to use. Children is an audience. So here's what I like to do. If Mom's Day Out is run by women's ministry, well, it serves children, so it belongs on the children's page. If uh, the, the weekly uh, Wednesday night meal also has a children's component, put it on the children's page, but also put a wanna, and also put on children's church on Sunday on that page, because the people who come to your site don't know how you're organized, you remember that phrase that we like to use, uh, we want people to belong before they behave? Navigations of, often ask people to behave before they belong. Understand how we're organized and go find the stuff. I'm hoping that if you come to the, the home page and see, well, I need a little bit more information, you go to something like Connect and you see children, you see adult, you see seniors. And you might not even have a seniors ministry, but if you're serving seniors with something, invite them, but tell them why they would care about it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I think you bring up another good point. When, when I'm so internal in my language, that, that does not need to be on my navigation. Here's oh, you example. mean you don't want to invite people to Koinonia? Right. <laughs> or, or like my navigation all, only at the top says, belong, believe, become. And I have to click in that and then see staff, Children's, you know what I mean? Like, yes. it, it's language that I don't know. Just, just say contact us. I don't need to dig through whatever, you know, taglines you have for your church. Oh, absolutely. To, do you agree with that? Oh, a hundred percent. And I even simplify my navigation even more. I do not think anybody should have an about tab on their navigation. Why? Because. Uh, we have these things called vanity metrics. You might be looking at your Facebook likes. We got 11,000 Facebook likes. We, on Instagram, we got 11,000 likes there, and we have 11,000 visits to our about page. 
A vanity metric says that all of these things must matter and are important. Whereas, unless you have a 100% click rate off of that about page, you probably have close to a 97% 97 bounce rate from about. That means people are going to about, are not getting the information or a CTA, a call to action, and are leaving your website. I put it in the footer. All right, so I'm going to push back on that. Okay. All right, and, so, and see what you think. So I can say that a staff page, our team, okay. is, is highly searched and highly clicked on. Okay. Okay. Yep. So where do I put that? If I don't have an about page where, or an about, where do I put that that people that's, can that's find great. my staff? I'm not saying that we need to get rid of it. What I'm saying is I want you to use your home page knowing that this is people are going to leave it. You want them to leave for the right reasons. Hopefully leaving is coming to your church. So what I do is I like to use the, uh, the homepage as this is who you can be. This is what you can experience. These are the people that care for you. Here are two people that we want. Here are some faces you, you'll see. Maybe it's the worship leader and the lead pastor. Maybe it's the lead college person or the lead youth, right? Two faces. Would you like to meet the rest of the staff? Learn more. Give them two sentences about that. And then if they really need to see that, they can go there. But I leave it in the footer so that people can then choose it on their own after I controlled the entire experience and got them to really see who they can be in that. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. All right. So land this for us. Give us some other tips or some other, like if I'm going to walk away and make sure my website, my homepage has this and this, what are some good takeaways that I can make sure I can implement this week? Right. So one of the things is, um, I want you to start looking at your websites um, based on product and audience. As you start writing about your products, right, the things that you have, it helps you understand who your church is and who you're serving. And then you can start writing about your audiences, children, men, and women. If you're working on your website right now, I want you to write your home page last. All right. Most times people get in, we're going to like, hey, let's just do the, the, let's start with the home page. When you write a book or I've, I've never written a book. Have you written a book? Almost done with number one. Okay. So, and you're going to write the introduction at the end, right? Like, okay. and then you're going to add it. That's the, it's a paradigm shift for us. Okay. We often just go in because, oh, I experienced the homepage as the, as the first thing. I'm going to write it first. Get really good at telling your story over and over and over again with products and audiences and then go back and say, I got one chance. This is what the homepage would look like. And a person would say, yeah, I love that idea. I totally see myself as a part of that. Write that last. That's, that's what I would do. Good. All right. How can we keep up with you? Where can we find you? Right. You can go to readverde.com. Uh, I'm there. Um, you can find me on YouTube. You can find me on Facebook. Um, I create um, just free materials for people to, to read and watch. Um, yeah. You can, and you can always hit me up on my website and just reach out. I love having these conversations. I love getting into meetings, you know, Calendly. I got a Calendly link, you know, for people to, to meet with me and do all that type of stuff. Awesome. Thank you so much, man. Hey, absolutely. I really appreciate it. The show notes for this episode are available now at makingsundayhappen.com. Well, guys, thank you so much for hanging out this week. Be sure to like and subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcast, whether that is uh, on YouTube, whether you're listening to us or watching us uh, on our website uh, or listening on Spotify, wherever you get your podcast your podcast, please like and subscribe. Uh, be sure to, to do that because in a couple of weeks we'll have Chris Tomlin on the show. You don't want to miss that one. So be sure to subscribe so that shows up directly in your podcast feed. All right. Next week on the show, I will welcome Elliot Wood. Elliot and I will be talking about how to not hate your church management software. So what can you do with your church management software to help you make Sunday happen better? Uh, that includes your systems. That includes following up with people. That includes uh, having visitors come to your church. All of that uh, and more will be on next week with Elliot Wood. All right. Again, it's all leading up to episode number 400. Big celebration show for us as we welcome Chris Tomlin to Making Sunday Happen. Uh, he'll be here on the podcast in just a few weeks for that milestone episode with us. So don't miss that one. All right, go out there and create some incredible worship experiences at your church this weekend. Go make Sunday happen. I'll catch you next week. Making Sunday Happen is a production of the Ministry of 1230 Media. 
For show notes, archive episodes, and more free resources for your church, visit makingsundayhappen.com.